and amen. It's good to see you all this morning. Glad we could join together to worship the Lord, our God, this morning. Um, as, that, as we get set up, um, I'm going to say a couple of things. First of all, it is, a, it is a wonderful thing to gather this day on the Lord's Day to worship the Lord together. And uh, I'm so happy that we get to do this and have this opportunity before us. And despite our situations and despite the things going on in our lives, we can still freely gather in this place this morning. Secondly, I want to thank Jared for taking the reins this morning. And um, it's a completely different Sunday when I can just rest the voice and just preach just instead of leading, singing, and preaching and stuff. So I appreciate you taking the reins, Jared, and the band. Y'all sounded wonderful this morning, and I'm not saying that just because I was in the band. <laughs> but, um, but it is a good day, uh, and, and I, I, give, I love giving Jared the opportunity to, to be in the, the front seat and take the reins. It gives me a nice break, a nice little reprieve. So thank you guys. Uh, last thing I want to share before we get into the message today is um, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And that is a wonderful time to be in the house of the Lord as a body of believers. So those of you that are here, I encourage you, come back Sunday. It's going to be a great time of worship, a great uh, message that's going to be brought. We have some other stuff going on that Sunday. You at home, we're glad you could join us online, but we would love to see you in this building next Sunday for Easter Sunday that we could gather together and celebrate the resurrection of Christ. So I encourage you at home, find your way here. Service starts at 1030, but if you come early enough, there's still donuts and snacks out there, and we'd love to provide some of that for you. And so um, Easter Sunday, next uh, next week, invite somebody, bring your friends, bring your neighbor. Um, I'd say bring your dog, but some of you might actually do that. So, um, uh, <laughs> But it's, it'll be a great Sunday to gather together and worship together. So uh, that brings us to today, though. Today, we are going, um, we have the privilege and honor of observing the Lord's Supper today. Uh, it's nothing that we should take lightly, and we'll get into some of that. But before we get into the Lord's Supper, there's a couple of things that I want to share is this. This message is intended for those that are believers in the work of Jesus on the cross. What does that mean for those of you that don't either know that message or that uh, don't believe that? Well, I'll put it to you plainly. I'm a sinner. You are a sinner. We've all done things wrong. From birth, we have a sinful nature. Scripture tells us plainly that yet God saw it within himself to send his son, Jesus, fully divine, fully man, to live the life that we couldn't, to fulfill the law, to be the lamb of our, that was our sacrifice, to spill his blood on our behalf so that we be, may be seen forgiven as we put our faith in the work of Jesus on the cross. And if you don't know that message, I'm glad I got to share it with you. If you want to talk about that message after the service, or you can grab somebody, tap them on the shoulder, and take them out back and talk about it now. That's great. I'd love to, for you to get that opportunity. Um, but it is important that that's the foundation that all of this is built on today, is that, the, that our collective faith in the work of the cross and that we are a body of believers in this house today. The second thing I want to share is, is a story. Um, I, I've come to the realization that uh, I don't appreciate the drive in San Antonio as much as I used to. Um, and, and, I, and I put it to you this way. I, I remember when Micah and I first came to San Antonio, and I, I think about two different times because we came in March in, in view of a call, and we were driving around looking at apartments, and everything was new, and we were like, oh, man, we're lost. I don't have a clue. And then, you know, we came back in May, and things were still new to us, and we we're still looking at everything, trying to see where all the restaurants were and everything. And now, as we drive from here to home or here to wherever, that, dri that drive has become a lot more familiar, but it has also become a lot more tiresome, depending on traffic, because we know what that's like, but also just routine, mundane. Um, but what's interesting is when I watch my son in the rearview mirror, and I see him on, on nearly every drive. It's like a new drive for him. He's sitting there watching the window and like seeing the trees go by and the cars, that, the big trucks that drive by on the freeway, all these different things. And it's every drive almost. And I bring this story up because it parallels what I'm going to talk about today. And I feel like those of the, I'm not going to say everybody because that's too collective, but there are a number of us I feel that take the Lord's Supper and view it like I view driving in San Antonio today rather than how Samuel views driving in San Antonio today. And that is what we're going to talk about today. God's Word um, spells out for us what, the, what this looks like, and we're going to dive into a few passages. And, uh, 
And so we're going to start in the Old Testament, but, but we're going to start in the Old Testament because the Bible tells us this. And if you want to go, your, your scriptures, uh, if you don't have a physical copy, I encourage you to find one in the chairs. There will be nothing on the screens behind me. So um, I encourage you to have a hard copy, or if you have it on your phone, pull that up. Uh, but we're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 10 and 11, for the most part of this morning. Um, and I'm going to do a short aside in the Old Testament, but you don't have to, to switch, switch over to that. But we start in the Old Testament because of this, because we have in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, it says, Now these things happened to them as as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The preceding verses in that list out a bunch of things that happened to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, the things they did wrong, the the repercussions of the things that they did. And so I I bring up this verse to say these things, the Old Testament is there as an example, and we're going to look at the Old Testament today as an example for us as we come to the Lord's table this morning. For our example this morning, like I said, you don't have to turn here, but if you're quick, you can. If you you got an A plus in Bible drill, you can go there, but Malachi chapter 1. Malachi is, one, is the very last book in the Old Testament, and um, here we're confronted with a, uh, the Old Covenant. Uh, this is the, there's a number of covenants in the Bible, and the Old Covenant being the Mosaic Covenant, and this is encompassing how they should act, uh, the things that they should do, the nation of Israel should do when they mess up and they're sinful. Um, and, and, but this is the, the, what we're looking at in this picture. And before I get into the story, I, I always do this, uh, and I want to ensure that we're on the same page, because I've, I, even in my life, and as I reflected on this message for this week, I realized the word covenant was something that I couldn't really define. And so what do we mean by the word covenant? Well, a covenant is a promise, uh, this is the, the dic- Bible dictionary version, a promise between two or more parties to perform certain actions. In this promise, both parties have a responsibility to act. The difference between a covenant and a promise is a promise is usually one-sided. So if I tell Micah, I'm gonna, I promise to do the dishes, she has no responsibility in that agreement. It's all me to do the. But if I say, I promise to do the dishes if you promise to do the laundry, both of us have a responsibility there. And if, there's, if we don't do those things, there's repercussions. This is kind of a, a really simplified version of what this looks like between God and the nation of Israel and God and us today as we look at the new covenant. But both parties have a responsibility. And the, these covenants can be conditional or unconditional. That was something for me that I was like, well, uncondition- it means you know, a covenant is unconditional. Well, that's not true. We look at um, something that's uh, unconditional. We, we look at the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, uh, covenant that God had with Abraham to create a nation through, through his offspring. There's nothing that they could do that was going to stop God from creating a nation from their offspring. Another unconditional one is the, is the covenant that God made with Noah to no longer flood the earth, that it will no longer happen again. Nothing is going to bring about God's uh, will to change his mind. I'm trying, Darren, to keep it from moving. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, so, so let's look at some conditional ones. We talked about the Mosaic one that we have here in the book of Malachi that is um, that they uh, are supposed to act a certain way. God gave them an instruction manual for how to do life. And if they don't live up to that instruction manual, they don't follow that instruction manual, there are repercussions. There, there are consequences of our sin, but then there are also things that God requires of the nation of Israel should they sin to get back into the good graces of his, and to approach him and approach his presence. The thing to um, look at with this is uh, while, while these covenants are, uncondition- or are conditional, I want to ensure you that God is never unconditional in his promises. He's always faithful and always true to uphold his part of the bargain. And later we will look at the new covenant, which is, li- which is listed for us in, in Luke chapter 22. But let's look at Malachi chapter 1. I'm going to read a couple of passages here. This is just two verses, verses 7 and 8. And it says, uh, verse 7, You are presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, How have we defiled you? In that you say, The table of the Lord is despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? 
Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you or would you receive it, says the Lord of hosts. We go down a little bit further. Verses 12 through 14 says, But you are profaning it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled. And as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how tiresome it is. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick. So you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am, great, I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. We read this passage, and I want us to see the attitude that has become the, of the Israelite people, and in particular here the priests that the Lord is referring to. Verse 13 again, um, this is you being the nation of Israel, the priests of Israel say, how tiresome it is, and you disdainfully sniff at it. So what this is telling us in the scripture that the, the, they've grown tired of the, the act of sacrificing and, and sacrificing animals to atone for their sins and do the things that God has called them to do in this um, Mosaic comfort covenant. And what has happened is they have lost sight of just how special this table really is. Why is this table special for them or why should they think that it's special? Well, this represented a few things. It represented the means of atonement that God provided for them. As they were, their sins were atoned for in this act of sacrifice, that reestablished their connection with God. With sin, there is no connection with God. God has nothing to do with sin, and there is nothing that they could do outside of what God has called them to do to reestablish that connection. And as they've done this, they've severed that connection. And as that connection is severed, that means communication is no longer there. Communication with God is no longer, as they have scoffed and despised the, te- the, lo- the table of the Lord in this example here. In this example, the Israelites grew tired of the very thing that made it so they could be in communion with God. To be in communion is another word that we throw around, and, and we, we use that word to represent this table here in front of us, the Lord's Supper, communion, the Eucharist. There's many different terms, that, uh, but to commune with one another is to have an intimate relationship with one another, to have an intimate conversation with one another. Back in, in ancient Israel, this meant to sit at the table with somebody and share a meal because meals for them were not uh, we're going to sit here for a half hour, talk over the high points, and leave. It was hours upon hours of sitting and talking and catching up and, and discussing the things of the Lord. And so this communion with God, this intimate relationship and conversation, could only be brought about by this sacrificial table. And the Israelites have disdained that. They've tossed it aside and said, you know, we're really tired of this. And in that, they've, the, they've done this to themselves. So we fast forward to the New Testament, and we'll get to our 1 Corinthians passages here. I mentioned earlier, Luke 22, verses 19 and 20, is where the new covenant is established. Jesus tells his disciples in this passage, um, I'm going to get there, I promise. Jesus says uh, to, to his disciples here, Verses 19 and 20, and when he gave, had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, This is the cup which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. So we have this new covenant that is established with the people of Israel and later to be discovered the, the Gentile nations of the world. And as we look to the Old Testament as our example, and they've become lackadaisical, lazy, they're tired of doing the routines, they've lost the sight of the special thing that is the Lord's table for them. I've told you at the beginning, I fear that some of us fall into that same category. But the Scripture again, in its fullness and wonderfulness, has given us a fair warning about doing these things. We talked about this on Wednesday night, and it was a wonderful opportunity to get together to prepare our hearts. But in 1 Corinthians 11, 
In verse 27, it says, Therefore, whoever eats the, uh, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So we have a warning of, of taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Approaching the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. We'll get into what that looks like here in, in a little bit. Uh, some specifics, but if we look to the Old Testament as our example... As we lose sight of the special thing that is the Lord's table, then we, we lose sight of the things that we need to do and it becomes a, 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 an unworthy approach to the Lord's table. And in this, I, I want to I I show you through Scripture that the table is still special. I want to show you why it still should have that deep-rooted meaning for us. I'll give us, I, what did I give us here? Four, four or five reasons. Goodness. The devil's working hard today, y'all. Me. For, you remember the old uh, Nintendo cartridges? Yeah. Seasoned pro. All right. If we don't touch it, maybe it'll cooperate. Um, but here we are. Four. Oh, okay. Four, thing, four, four or five reasons why the table is still special to us today. The table is still special to us because it reminds us of what Christ did for us. We are reminded of Christ's saving work on the cross. Again, I reference the, the passage in Luke chapter 22. Where, where it pour, he says, I've poured out the, my blood for you. This is my body for you. It's the things that he's done for us, and it's the gospel that I presented at the beginning of the message today. This table, as we, do, as we partake in this Lord's table, reminds us of the saving work of Christ on the cross. The table is still special to us today because it reminds us of our identity in Christ. We share in the body and life of Jesus Christ as we partake of the table. Here's a, a passage to back that up. We're 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. And it says, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is it not the cup of blessing which we bless and share in the blood of Christ? Is it, not which, is it not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? We share in these things with Christ. It's not Him separate from us, but we share in these things. And as we approach this table... We are, we, and we take these elements, we are remembering what He has done for us, and we are partaking in it with Christ. And it's important uh, that we sit at the right table as well. As we approach this table, um, uh, we, we look at this as the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, and we have the Lord on our mind. But as we depart from this place, it's easy to sit maybe at the wrong table. And you say, Matt, what are you talking about the wrong table? Well, let me tell you, because the Scripture has something to say about that as well. As we continue to read in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 18 through 22, it says, Look at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in the demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than He, are we? This passage tells me, tells me two things. We can sit at the Lord's table, we can, or we can sit at a demon's table. We can't sit at both. We can't ride the fence on it. What does that look like? Well, we can sit at the, the table of the Lord and be in communion with Him, communicating with Him. Or we can sit at the other table, the table where the demons are, and they're saying, you know what? God didn't really tell you this, did He? Maybe you, should, you, you could do this. Seems to be a familiar picture that was painted for us in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. 
So it's important that we know what table we are approaching, not only in this moment together today, but as we dis- depart here from here today and know that we, uh, that we continue to sit at the table of the Lord and to commune and communicate with the, t- with the Lord as we go through our day-to-day life. thing to, to remember is that, that the demons can be in any aspect of, of life. It can be in finances, it can be in our marriage, it can be in our habits. But the good news is Jesus can be in all those things as well. It just depends on what table you choose to sit at. The third thing that the table reminds us of, it, is it reminds us of our unity with one another as saints, as, as believers in the work of the cross. 1 Corinthians 10, 17, since there is one bread... We who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. This oneness with each other, this unity with each other, as we approach the Lord's table, we were reminded that we are united in one spirit and one body of Christ. And in this unity, we should be able to see Jesus in each other's lives. As we are reminded of what he has done and the things that he's called us to do, we should be able to see in Jesus in each other's lives. And in our unity and our family of God that we have before us, we have duties to one another. We have plenty of, of instances in Scripture that, can, that give us commands on how to interact with one another. To take care of the widows and the orphans. To love your brother as yourself. And the list could go on and on. And I want to encourage you, these are things that we should be doing, but these works are not salvific in themselves, but they are a fruit of our salvation. And, that, and they are a fruit of the reminder that we have here before us, that Christ did the ultimate sacrifice for us, and that we have these duties that he's given to us. Fourth thing that we have for today as we approach the Lord's table is we proclaim the Lord's death. We proclaim the gospel. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it says in verse, um, sorry, the cracks are getting me. Um, verse 26 of chapter 11 says, For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every time we partake of the Lord's table. All right, hold on. Every time we partake in the Lord's table, we proclaim His good news. Who do we proclaim that good news to? Well, as we track back to one, uh, one point above, we proclaim that to each other. We, put, we remind ourselves of the good news of the gospel. Who else do, does this message get proclaimed to? Well, this message gets proclaimed to the lost. This is why I started this message today by presenting the gospel to you that are here in this room and to you that are watching online, that any of you be lost, that you would see that there is a loving God who had a, has son come down as a sacrifice on your behalf. But then this proclamation doesn't stop there. This proclamation then finds its way across the aisle to the other table where the demons are sitting. As we proclaim our salvation through the work of Christ. We proclaim the gospel through the taking of the Lord's Supper and sitting at the Lord's table. We are reminding the demons we are not theirs. We do not belong to them. We remind them that when Christ died, he didn't stay dead. He defeated death, but not only did he defeat death, he defeated the devil and put him to shame and up in front of everybody for everyone to see. As we come to the the conclusion here, the fifth point I want to say, um, we'll we'll recap and then get to point five. Recapping point one, it reminds us of what Christ did for us. Point two, reminds us of our identity in Christ. Point three, reminds us of our unity with one another as saints. Point four, it, it reminds us and we are proclaiming the Lord's death as we take the Lord's Supper. The fifth thing that I feel that this does for us, church, is it brings us to a point of self-examination and purification. What do I mean by this? Let's look at the scriptures. Maybe it can tell, us for, uh, tell it to us for us. 1 Corinthians 11, 
27 and 28. We've already read 27, but let's keep reading that. So 11 verses 27, 28. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We have command, examine yourself before you come partake of the, the cup and the bread. As we examine ourselves, I want to encourage you that your prayers should sound very similar to that of Psalm 193, 23, and 24, which says, uh, I thought I wrote that one down, but we'll get there. <clears throat> Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Other translations say, uh, this one says hurtful way, but other translations say um, wicked ways, offensive ways, grievous ways. This should be our prayer as we examine our hearts as we approach the Lord's table. Hopefully there's been some of that before, but in these moments before us, we'll have an opportunity to do that. And as God reveals those things, those wicked ways, those things that are sinful in our life, and we remember the cross, we should have no other desire than to confess and repent. And so it's at this moment that we, we come to the Lord's table together. As we come to the table today, we enter now before we, we come forward a time of self-examination. I encourage you to take this time seriously. I pray that you don't find yourself guilty of approaching the table in an unworthy manner, as the Israelites did in Malachi, as we are warned against in 1 Corinthians. The table of the Lord is special, and it deserves every bit of reverence that we can give to it today. And so in these moments to come, Jared's going to play on the, just some music on the guitar. And I encourage you, as we, as we have these moments, spend time with the Lord. S examine yourself. Say, Lord, search me, try me, know my thoughts, show me my wicked ways, that I could, I could confess and repent of those things. And as you do that, I, uh, we are going to come up on our own. So as you've had time with the Lord and you feel like that time has come to a, a conclusion, We'll invite you to come on your own accord to grab the elements here. You can come down the center aisle, grab your elements, and then off to the side back to your seat. And then as, as everybody comes and grabs their elements, we will have a time together where we partake together. But in these moments now, church, I encourage you, spend time with the Lord. Say, Lord, search me, try me, know my heart. Reveal these things to me that I might confess to you that I may not come to this table in an unworthy manner.
the scriptures tell us on that night that they gathered in the upper room, shared this last meal with Christ before he went to the cross. That Christ took the bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. This, uh, do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray for, for the bread. Father, we thank you for the bread and your body that was put on that cross for us. Lord, that uh, you took uh, the, the, the burden that we could not bear. And Lord, I thank you that we have this opportunity now to remember what you have done on our behalf. Father, we thank you for your body and, and the, the suffering that it went through on our behalf. Father, we love you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We give thanks. And then the scripture continues to tell us in the same way he took the cup and also <clears throat> after supper saying, this is new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray over the cup. Father, we thank you for your blood that covers our sins, that was spilt on our behalf. Lord, the, the blood of the Passover lamb that has eternal ramifications. We thank you for your blood and that it washes us white as snow. And the Lord, through our faith and the work of the cross, we can come before you, come before your Father and offer this form of worship together today. Lord, we thank you again for your sacrifice and the blood that covers a multitude of sins. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And we give thanks. In these moments, we're going to close with a, a song together. This is a time that is, has the opportunity to rejoice in what Christ has done for us as we remember that this day. It is also a time to respond to the Spirit's leading this, this day. And that can look like many different things. You've heard the, the gospel message this morning, the sacrifice that Christ laid down on your behalf. If this message has resonated within your heart today, I encourage you. There will be gentlemen, ladies even up front that you could talk to about that. I encourage you, if you have to still deal with some things with the Lord, the altar is here. You can come kneel before the Lord. You can come speak to the, the people that will be up front and ask them to pray for you. We would love to do that in these times that we're singing together. If you're feeling the Lord tugging on your heart to join this body of believers and become a member of Thousand Oaks Bible Church, you can do that as well. But in these moments as we sing together, church, I encourage you, sing, but also be in tune with the Spirit of the Lord as He is working in your hearts today. I invite you, church, let's stand together as we sing.